What on earth is that? It's a journey in the comics network production! Tell me something, my friend. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? What? I always ask that of all my prey. I just like the sound of it. Brought to you by the power of the Journey Into Comics Network. This is the Journey Into Comics Podcast. The show that's 100% dedicated to everything nerd. With your hosts, the Podfather, Nate Phillips, the Podmaster, Brandon Stone, and the Journey Into Comics Network stepdad, Tyler McLaughlin. Time to make the chibi chunks. Hey! Excellent! Finally. What did you do? And here we go. Can somebody tell me what kind of a world we live in where a man dressed up as a bat gets all of my press? This town needs an enema. Welcome back, True Believers, to another episode of Journey Into Comics. Today, it's Journey Into Comics 324. I am your host, Nate. Today, joining me, as always, welcome back to the show. First and foremost, let's get it out of the way here. A big welcome back to the one and only stepdad of the JICN, the king of all that is podcasting, the biggest swinging dick in the room, even though he acts like he's got the smallest dick swinging in the room. Welcome back. (laughs) <laughs> welcome back yet again tyler how's it going brother it's going great uh sorry for not being here last week uh it's okay i had i had a a uh much coveted uh rarely uh a, a chi or um what's the word uh acquired or or attained whatever obtained that's the word i'm tired <laughs> <laughs> rarely obtained day off of work so um yeah it felt good to just relax for a day cool and then like you know you would think that i would get like a holiday and a holiday weekend off uh no i've been at work since friday so good, good lord I'm, man i'm over it shit well today tyler joining us also back to the show welcome back yet again the man who needs no introduction. If you're seeing this in video form, he is 1 million percent responsible. God damn it. And that's the way we like it. Welcome back to the show yet again. Brando, the pod master. How are you, my good dude? Doing good. Glad to be here today. I'm glad that we could be here to talk about some pretty cool stuff that's kind of going on in the world. Uh, when there's not a whole lot of good going on in the world, uh, to be honest. It's, like it's, it's easy to check out. Uh, I mean, we just did Absolutely. have a good holiday. Uh, here uh, a nice quiet one uh, we didn't mm-hmm. do any big gatherings or anything like that but smoked a turkey breast c- turned out t- a crazy thing cr- crazy thing it, like it was delicious and then the second night it was even more delicious because mm-hmm. that that smoke flavor came out even better you know like, mm, something about something about that microwave is like hey smoke flavor pulling you out a little bit and it's like mm-hmm. just enough man just enough can we right here on t- 324 make a pact that in 2021 we are going to have a friendsgiving where the three of us get together and cook. Please. Skylar, Skylar, and I, you know, I, I to to talk about my Thanksgiving. Please. Um, you know, we we sat down. Skylar and I cooked all day. Uh, Skylar tried out some new recipes, and you know, not all of them turned out. But for like the first time, I've been telling everybody since since Thursday that. This is the first Thanksgiving that I've enjoyed and looked forward to and have like a positive I now have positive memories of Thanksgiving. It's the first one since I was like 5 or 6 years old. I fucking hate Thanksgiving and I hate Christmas because I have to be around people that I don't want to be around. I don't want to leave my house. I just want to relax. And I especially now like you know, we didn't take the kids anywhere. We're not going to take the kids anywhere for Christmas. And I remember all the times that I was drug when I was a kid from house to house to house to house. And it's like, it's you know, exhausting. 
it's exhausting and they don't they don't get a say in it you know they're grouchy they're tired they just want to relax too Mm -hmm. so i had a an absolute blast of a day i got to relax and you know we were finishing up the our meal uh thursday night and i was like you know what i i really next year i I want to do this again where it's just us but like maybe friday have a thanksgiving with just the people that like like all the people from the network and then like you know the people that i play D with and you know not everybody has to be there at the same time stop by for an hour or two and then you know go do whatever you want we need Holiday should be about spending time with the people that you want to be with, not the people that you have to be with. Bingo. I think the greatest quote, and I live my life by this quote, is blood makes you related. Mm-hmm. Loyalty makes you family. Yeah. And uh, at holidays, we're told, hey, spend time with your family. But I think that gets crossed with spend time with people you are related with that you have been programmed to be told you must spend time with. And you know what? This year we had a limited Thanksgiving ourselves, and it was only a very few people, and it was um, really nice. It was refreshing. It was the first year in a while that I did the bird and got to, you know, go ham on the bird, I guess is the way to – that's not what I'm – no, but you know what I'm saying. I got to, like, put my 100% effort into, like, there's enough people here that are going to be here. It was, like, five people, six people max, I think that I want them to walk away going all the side dishes were good, but fuck that Turkey. Like that Turkey was something else. And I, and I think I achieved that. I don't, I didn't tell everybody that I made the Turkey, but I was hearing the comments and it was 99.9% positive. So I'm happy with the results. So this year was the first year that I didn't brine the Turkey. Uh, normally when I make it and, and, and smoke it on the grill, I, I've brined it and I have this brine that I've been doing. But last year I also injected, and then I was doing a little bit of light reading this year, and I kind of read that that's kind of overkill. You don't have to do both. In fact, there's arguments for doing one or the other. So mm-hmm. this year, I'm like, you know what? I am just going to inject. And I did a, a very basic and easy injection of where I used – it was a mixture of butter, oil, and uh, Cajun seasoning. Um, and uh, so we injected the bird with that. The bird got covered with Cajun seasoning on the outside of the skin, on the inside of the skin, everywhere that you can put it. And that sucker smoked for about four, four and a half hours. Damn. And, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, uh, I used uh, – a lot of people use, like, cherry wood or apple wood when they use turkey. It's a – like, those are, like, some milder uh, smokes. And, 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 and they also taste great. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I also – me personally, I'm, I'm, I'm a big sucker for that hickory flavor. I love the hickory mm-hmm. smoke flavor. So what I do is that even though it's smoking the bird – I only really do two rounds of like wood smoke, I, and I do it right at the beginning, and then one after the first check, and the rest of it after that is just using charcoal to keep the temperature where I want it uh, to a point where it's going to get done, and and it, and it did, and man, my wife killed it this year, dude. Kate brought it. She, I saw the picture of the sides in the oven, bro. I looked. I felt hungry looking at them. Like I was uh, like, "Damn!" Yeah, she she found this recipe a couple years ago for for this for you know for bread dressing, because everybody on her side of the family makes like cornbread dressing, and she hates it. So, oh really? Like coming to my family, it's like this is normal. Damn it! Why do they make cornbread dressing? And it's like for me, it's like I've never had cornbread dressing before. I met her family, so to me, it's kind of interesting and different enough just to have mm-hmm. a little bit on the plate for some variance. For her, she just bleh. <laughs> she's sick of it. But then uh, one thing that people in my family make is like this uh, cornbread casserole or corn pudding or whatever you want to call it. And, we uh, call it spoon cornbread. Spoon cornbread. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it, everybody's got different names for it. But so, so, so we tried our hands at that this year, and it turned out really good. And then we did homemade, it looked mash, good. Yeah, homemade mashed potatoes, green bean casserole. That all, it was all just delicious. And top it off with some Hawaiian rolls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, just take a big slat of Hawaiian rolls, put them in the oven. You like you brush them with some butter, and the butter just bastes on top of them and melts right in. It, dude, it's to the point where you don't have to put any butter on the inside of them. There's so much freaking butter that just slides down your throat. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I, uh, I, you know, I made I made the turkey uh, like I have the last couple years. Um, you know, I, I've talked. I don't know if I've talked on the show or not about how like 
you know, everybody's got their chefs that they like and they dislike and, you know, they, they, they try and uh, imitate in, in the kitchen or, or mirror, you know, so to speak. Uh, fucking Matty Matheson has been mine for the last couple of years. He is the fucking man. Oh, my and God. I, and I like, you know, that guy, that guy brings it. And I watched a video two or three years ago of him doing a turkey and it, they, he does it in the oven a way that I've never like my whole life. You know, when I was a kid, my grandma would get up at like two or three o'clock in the morning and cook the turkey and the cook, turkey would cook all goddamn day long at like 200 degrees. And I would get it and it'd be like, I, Mush I, awfulness. I, I fucking understand why people don't like to eat turkey at Thanksgiving because this shit's fucking gross. Like all the respect in the world, Grant, I love you, but your fucking turkey's awful. That's why I cook it now. But um, <laughs> it's real simple: 450 degrees for an hour and 15 minutes. Knock her down to 325 and just let it go till to temperature. You know, you don't you don't have to worry about it. Um, that is one thing to jump in real quick that uh, that I've seen across a bunch of different like uh, videos or or, or or recipes. Like especially like in like for 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 doing it on the grill or on the smoker, you know, uh, I don't have one of those self maintaining smokers, the electric ones that just like you plug it in, you put your stuff in, and it's like, hey, there you are at like three hundred, and and you're set to go. I don't. I have to manually mm -hmm. check it, and of course, what does that mean? When I add more charcoal, what does it do? It shoots up. It's hot. It gets really hot. Now I also have mine off. I have like a rectangular grill, so mine's all the way off to the side. Where it's like literally, I put my hand in there and I don't feel any heat, like comparatively. So, so I do have that, but like I always, I always like get like get that I'm cooking this and I'm freaking out because it's not going what it should do. And so it's mm -hmm. like for me, it always gets done sooner than what I think. It always mm -hmm. gets hotter than what I want it to get. And then on on the rare occasion. I look out that window and I freak out because oh crap I let it go too long and I got to run back out there and I'm like I and, and I hope there's enough heat to get these coals lit <laughs> God I'm an idiot. That's one thing about it though you know I've had the same experience. You know I've I've smoked like multiple whole birds I've done breasts just like you. You know I I'm a big fan of the hickory and mesquite mm -hmm. more so than the fruit woods just like you said. Next year, next year, I think I'm going to, I'm going to deep fry a turkey. I've, Ooh. I've, I've done different variations of that, but I've never done a whole bird and I've never done like a, like a root, like a legit Cajun turkey. And I've always wanted to do one. So I think that's going to be my big task next year. Um, I think I'm going to do – I'm going to deep fry a turkey for Thanksgiving, and I think I'm going to do a prime rib for Christmas because, you know, most people hate turkey at Thanksgiving. I hate ham at Christmas. I don't – it's just – I mean, I'd rather eat prime rib, you know, or I'd rather eat another turkey, to be honest with you. Um, so, all right. I, I cooked a 20-pound turkey this year. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Um, and last year I did like a 19-pound bird. And I was reading something the other day by uh, a pretty popular chef that I like, and he said, just get two, like, 10-pound turkey, turkeys, and then you can cook, you can do different things with them. And then, you know, if if you don't have as many people, you can just leave the bird whole for a couple hours and then carve it at a different time. And, you know, there's all kinds of different stuff. And I was like, God, that makes sense. Why have I never done that before? Fuck a 20-pound turkey. I'll just get, like two or three small ones, and then I'll just have a turkey extravaganza. And they're easier to, <laughs> they're yeah. easier to cook then, too, because like, they're a lot smaller yeah. and easier to regulate. Yeah, they don't have to cook as long. Uh, no, about that prime rib, I, I want to take my shot at making some prime rib on the grill. You know, every year we do do ham. Uh, that's both of our families have done that in the mm -hmm. past. Um, so I, I usually get a spiral cut ham, and it's already done, but I, I smoke it again on yep. the grill. And she makes – a and lot she, of success doing that. Yeah, and, and she makes this badass Coke, you know, Coca-Cola type glaze. You know, mm -hmm. it, 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 and it's good shit. You know, just like, and then we do like a hash brown type casserole and stuff like that. But I, I've told her, I said I, I want to do a prime rib, and she doesn't. She says that she doesn't like it uh, that much. And doesn't like prime rib. Yeah. Now here's the thing. Uh, part of her want to not do this kind of goes back to when her dad spent all this money on this prime rib for this big family Christmas 
mm-hmm. and nobody wanted to eat it because she made potato soup and everyone was all about her potato soup. And he was mm-hmm. a bit jealous that nobody was touching his prime rib that he spent all that money on. Mm-hmm. And so I noticed like it was the same thing with pork chop. I couldn't get this woman to eat pork chops for the first few years that we were together because every single time that she had pork chops, they were always dry. I'm like, yeah. And so I'm just like, well, then they weren't making it right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a good pork chop is juicy and, you know, like just tender. tender. Yeah. You know, it's really good. And so when there's science, there's science behind that, too, because if you remember, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, everything was uh, pork is the new white meat. Yeah. We've got to overcook it. Yeah. They they bred the they bred all the fat out of the pork. So it was like eating paper, paper covered hockey pucks. Mm hmm. You know, everyone, I do remember everyone that. wanted the the, you know, eighth of an inch thick pork chops with no fat because it was healthy. That shit's gross, man. Get that out of here. So, the OK, so what like what I'll do with my pork chops is that I'll if, if I get the thick boys, I will actually slow cook those on the grill for about mm-hmm. maybe an hour. And, it, and they're usually nice and good and done. And I'll have them offset. And then what I'll usually do is uh, sauce them up and then finish them, caramelize that over the like, over the flames. But if I get some smaller ones, some thinner ones, I will bread them up in Williams hot wing breading that my dad used Thinking to fry. Language. Yeah, he used to he used to bread up some some chicken wings with this and deep fry them. And I'll deep fry the the freaking pork chops with it. So you got some you know some like pork fritter type deal, and they're in the hot wing breading, and there it just goes really well with it. And um, the unfortunate thing is I cannot find that Williams stuff anywhere. The IGA oh, where Nate and I grew up in the Hoopston used to have it. That's where my dad bought it. You can't find it there anymore. And the only place I've been able to find it is Amazon, where it's eighteen dollars for like three packs. Yeah. So typically, if I'm gonna do wings, I use three packs because I when I'm making wings, I'm making like thirty something wings. Right. I'm not making like ten. Nate knows, like when I make wings, like he uh he don't I, fuck around. Well, I, in fact, Nate, that was the crockpot wings, right? The uh, where I did the root beer and barbecue sauce, and then I did the oh, habanero, yes. and then I made up my own for like this general so sesame, oh god, inst- inspired one. And my literally, tummy has never hurt so good. <laughs> so, like, I had three different kinds of wings with three different slow cookers going on at the same time. And then, like, when I finished them up, because each of the other ones were just like, it was like root beer, sauce, and then salt and pepper. And then for the habanero, I did like some, some different seasonings and some different kinds of like habanero sauce. Mm-hmm. And then I just uh, broil it under the broiler for like five minutes to kind of. Crisp up. Oh, and I put I sprinkle some some brown sugar on top of the wings before I, I put them in the broiler, and it kind of helps caramelize that sauce a little bit. And uh, whew. man, we just spent this whole like first twenty minutes talking about food. I'm hungry. Foodies watching comics. Yeah, Wait, yeah, food, yeah, man. Like, Journey, like I'm all Journey's hungry now. Uh, n- no. Total side note. I just this now is the perfect time to mention this. For whatever reason, today is, you know, uh, November 29th, and my next-door neighbor has her grandson mowing her yard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That tracks. <laughs> Not even my mowing ladies, like my mowing lady. Well, that sounds terrible. My mowing neighbor. She, uh, the, 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 the lady that mowed. After the tornado or during before, the tornado Before, during, and after a tornado. <laughs> the ground is sopping wet. It is damn near flooded. And she's out there. I got to get this backyard finished and it's somewhere on my Facebook. I posted a video of it where I'm walking outside going like the siren is going off in the video. I remember this. Yeah. And like it is still going off because there's a tornado in the area. Granted, not directly in our town anymore, but it's like on the outskirts and there's a, there's, there's a funnel cloud and everything. And she's out there going this fucking tornado, like just ruined my day. I was out here mowing, doing my thing. This yard needs to get done. She turns around. She's like, Tornado, you're a pussy. And she push mows everything. <laughs> yeah, that means she's a total badass. She could totally call a tornado <laughs> a pussy and get away with it. Dude, I, if I was out there, I'd be slipping and sliding everywhere all over that grass and just like. Mm. Do you remember? 
weren't you watching that time I tried to like go to hump Jason's car and I slipped? <laughs> <laughs> Crunch my ball. We caught that on tape. Um, we did the Draxus cribs. It was like oh, yeah. DXS cribs instead of MTV cribs, and we just like you even got on your bed and did like did the little like hump motion. Like this is where the magic happens. <laughs> and, like, was a virgin when I said that. <laughs> yeah, there like, ain't no magic <laughs> happening here. Yeah, I, I I remember that. I remember Jason walking outside, going to the garage and sticking his face in the pool, which is covered, which is full of snow. Just. And then you go into the, like showing off your dad's Fiero, and, and then you said, "Now a lot of people have 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 the manual version of this, but this is a stick shift." Whoops! <laughs> Whoops! And then we went outside, and then you ran up to do like a running hump of Jason's car, and there was ice, <laughs> and you slid right out underneath you. Not only that, but you were wearing Jason's shoes. Because he was still inside the house, and he was on the porch like, you took my shoes, you dick. Oh, if we have this great. video, if, if Jason has that, if we have that somewhere, that is some candid footage that will be cringeworthy as fuck. Worse than anything Blaine has ever, well. No, not as bad as his little, like, two-minute, three-minute shout-out video. What's up, guys? This is my shout-out. Hey, M, shout-out. What's up? Victoria, shout out. Hey, Victoria, keep love you. Shout out. I lo hey, hey, love, love you. you. Keep doing your thing. Shout out. I mean, he is the OG pod god. Hey, man. Shout out. Can you imagine if that's all we did here on the show? Hey, just want to let you guys know, we shout love out. you. You know, shout out to all that to to all that everybody listening. And you went shout out to Todd McFarlane. Shout out, man. You're doing pretty good work. You know. Shout <laughs> out. Like your toys. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, oh, there you know there is some good shit that came out this week in the form of the Mandalorian. Oh my god, toddy, Jesus, crying out! Goodness, I am I am moist right now. I knew he was gonna say it. Our boy Dave Filoni, not full of baloney, that's for sure. <laughs> god damn, it. Nate, um, I don't have the power to remove you from the stream, but I wish hey. I did. The last podcast we did, I walked <laughs> off the show. That's real story. True story. I fucking quit the show for a minute. Well, they also like wanted to remove you from that one too at some point, right? It's true. Yeah, it's true. In fact, they in fact I believe they said that they you were the imposter and you were getting voted out. Mm-hmm. <sighs> true. Keep it rolling, man. Keep it rolling. Uh no, Dave Filoni brought it, man. Freaking he, he wrote the episode and directed the episode, and who else better to handle such an episode that that is going to be the, the the live action debut. Now, great spoilers as a f whatever you want to say or whatever the cool hip kids are saying right now. Hit you, pause. You know, if you, if you hit pause, go watch it. Come back. Anyway, now that they're gone, the live action debut of Ahsoka Tano uh, being played by Rosario Dawson, which is awesome. Uh, perfect. Like the only other person that would be better than her would be the actual voice actress who played her. Yes, that's that's been the biggest. Let's get the complaints uh, out of the way. Um, for once, my time spent on the internet here lately has not been full of everyone hating it. It's yeah. been. We really wish the voice actress could have played her. Rosario Dawson did great, and no, I, like I haven't even seen anybody complain about the makeup. Like, remember season one. Uh, on the the prison ship when we were all complaining about how the toilets looked and how like Yo, Daddy, what's hold on <laughs> <laughs> special <laughs> guest Ruby I'll dropping by the minute. podcast help mommy. I love that that's great um you know we 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 complained about how awful that looked and I I had no complaint this episode was great Michael Bean was in it yeah cool he little had a shot he had a shotgun like he always does. Cool little like cameo for him too. It, like it wasn't announced he was gonna be in it. He was just like we were watching it, and I'm like, "That's Michael B." <laughs> yeah, I I dug it. Episode was fantastic. Uh, I believe this is the first official appearance of an a proper Jedi in the Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. a and then of course, the first time we've officially seen a lightsaber in the Mandalorian proper. And it was uh, everything, the first 20 minutes or the first 
t- more like 10 minutes of the show plays out like a horror movie. Like her in the forest just taking out dudes left and right. It was, it was, God, that was so sick. incredible. It was very samurai, you know, with the yes. whole western with the whole uh, western motif that they've had for the show. Uh, this felt like the samurai, uh, you know, you know, seven samurais, whatever yes. that old style, because you have that stuff for her picking them out in the, um, in like, like in the woods and being going through the fog and through the night and, and, and being like a shadow. But the other part that really made me feel that was when, um, just jumping ahead when she shows up in the village and it's just her and she, and, uh, M- M- you know, Mando hasn't made his presence yet uh, coming back in. But she has that kind of stare down, uh, walking down that street, of her on one side versus the other side has all those people, guards, and uh, HK assassin droid is something to come back to, and then Michael Bean, and then uh, and she's just standing there by herself, ready to do the, her whole little like you almost could have seen like the little like letterbox come in, mm-hmm. and you could have heard like the little like spaghetti western, the like little whistle type deal. But no, it was. Thematically, it was awesome. I thought Rosario did a great job mm-hmm. playing a you know that 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 is such an important task. You know, she, uh, Ahsoka has been one of the most important characters to not have been included in any live action anything, mm-hmm. and also one of the most divisive characters, like in all of Star Wars. You know, with you know, I I went uh like off the rails bitching about Ahsoka and why I don't care for the character, but incredibly important to the story incredibly important to the narrative. Like forget about all the gray Jedi stuff that all the super nerds have been bitching about the last four or five years. She, she was around for some shit. Yeah. And there's a lot, and there's a lot of story to tell there still. So wh- why not? You know, if, if, if we got to have, I shouldn't even say it that way, but like, if we gotta have somebody, why not have somebody incredibly interesting? You know what I mean? So, well, lo- it, I and, and it, it totally works. It totally works because because it, it gives her character. Obviously, uh, you know, Dave Filoni's been around for a long time. You know, mm-hmm. he's written Ahsoka for a long time. You know, go back and watch that whole roundtable thing. It, if you the the Mandalorian gallery is that what you're talking yes, about? Yes, go watch that son of really a bitch fucking good. And tell me that Dave Filoni isn't the heir apparent. Yeah, there sure. is no person like, and there's a lot of guys who are great, but there's no singular one person who understands Star Wars like he does, other than George Lucas. Yeah, he is the apprentice. Like, ser- like I watched that. And the He's whole the chosen one. The whole thing blew my mind with the whole thing, and 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 that's a conversation for 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 a different time. But like knowing that he was directing this, knowing that he was writing this, knowing that it was Ahsoka, because we already knew that a few episodes back that you know with Bo Katan mm-hmm. we're we're you know we're getting Ahsoka, and what's awesome like her story, when you first started off, it's it's hard to watch as a as as a adult fan mm-hmm. of Star Wars. But her story is also some like one of the more heartbreaking. Oh, it's tragic. And it'll you, fucking make yeah, you sad. <laughs> it will. It, it it will, you know. And then she went into hiding just like almost everybody else. She walked away from the Jedi because she saw what it did to someone who she really admired, like one of her best friends. Well, and the Jedi turned their back on her. Yes, yeah, yes. Also that as well. I mean, we can't we can't like that 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 is the schism. The whole reason Ahsoka is who Ahsoka is is because she was framed, you know, by the fucking dark side. And mm-hmm. then the Jedi Council is like, uh, we don't care. Uh, we're never wrong. And then she's like, no, you are wrong. And they're like, we don't care, but you can come back if you want. Fuck off. See, the council for that time was very flawed. Mm-hmm. So caught up in their own dogma. And that is, that's another thing that, that Yoda bears. That's part of the reason why why not not only does he go into exile, but where he exiles himself too. It, it, it was his failure. It was his greatest failure. You know, you brought up Yoda really quick. I do I do need to quickly side tangent. There's one thing that the uh, the episode kind of fucked up in the lineage of Star Wars, and maybe it's Dave Filoni's choice to say that this character doesn't exist, or maybe they decided to write them out. But 
that episode said there was only one being before the child. We'll get to the naming thing in a little bit, but like mm. there was only one being before that was talking about Yaddle. Yeah. And it was Yoda. They did not mention Yaddle. And I think that is a misstep because Yaddle is just as important. She served on the Jedi Council. And, along and, with... and she's canonically, she's real. She's she's Star Wars canon. I mean, this is I'm also saying, from man, Ahsoka's perspective, weird. too, though. Oh, that's true. That is true. She might not. She was too young. Yeah, she wasn't. She wasn't around in uh, Phantom Menace. Because hmm. Clone Wars takes place in between two Attack two. of the Clones and yeah. Yeah. And yeah, at that so, point, the council had changed yet again. So, mm-hmm. so from her perspective, and it's very interesting that we fi- this is the biggest info dump we've had on the child or yeah, Grogu. Grogu, thoughts? I like it. Yeah, it's it's all right. Like I don't hate it. It's well, his name wasn't gonna be fucking Steve. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey, I was I was holding out hope for Steve. Okay. <laughs> Also, Mando's like, you know his name? Is She's it like, a- yeah, it's Steve. Tyler. It's Jim. <laughs> t- Tyler, did did you not feel a twinge of flashback when he's trying to guide him to plug in the right wire? Like, ha- have we not all been there with our own dads? Mm-hmm. Staring at your dad like you're an idiot? He's like, uh, <laughs> the red one. <laughs> Attach the end of the red one to where the blue one plugs in. No, no, that's the blue one. <laughs> no, no, that's the same one. That's still the blue one. It and also had rocket let, group vibes. And don't yeah. let them touch. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Oh man. Oh man. Anytime I see any of those like like it, it, child breaking down in tears, holding the flashlight memes. I instantly think of Tyler, and I always try to tag him and send him. Is yep. this? And I got a lot of those vibes. I also really like when she connects with with Grogu and is able to learn his name. The moment Mando says his name, hmm? you're talking to me. It's like, yeah. I I like that. And it also highlights, too, in in the episode, how these two characters, Mando and Grogu, feel about each other. Mm -hmm. Mando wants to move on, but now it's to the point where it's like, man. It's his little buddy, man. They can't can't separate. That that scene where he said, time to say goodbye, I was openly ugly crying because I thought it was over. I was like, what is the story now? Like, if you're getting what... I just I just didn't understand. And then, of course, that's the big swerve is that that's not the case. Um, But there's so much within the episode to still kind of cover and roll through with what they actually attempted to do. We had a massive name drop of a character that is like we're this close to getting a live action character that could be game changing. So when you got to think, too, we're still reeling from information last week. You know, at the end of the episode last week, fucking dark troopers mm-hmm. like, uh, uh, what? And that the Razor Crest is bugged and Moff Gideon knows what's going oh, yeah. on. And, and Moff a- Gideon's got Darth everything. Vader armor now. Yes. Also, did you guys know that the Darksaber in that first season was a real thing they made? Like, not that it worked, but like it was a prop that was working. Oh, it wasn't CGI. No, I didn't know that. Watch the roundtable thing. You'll see the scene where he, where um, Giancarlo Esposito comes out, and it's like a fucking th- – it looked cool. I was like, shit, that looks cool. Sell that. I want that. Dope. Yeah. Got to have that. But, but I, now I can't – now I'm upset, though, because they they just, you know, released that Sweet Child of Mine video, mm-hmm. you know, but with, with uh, the child as Axel and all that shit. Right. Sweet Grogu of mine just does not have the same ring. It just doesn't it doesn't work so good. I go ahead. I, I, was, like I was really really quick from the from last week's episode when he uses the force to get the blue Oreo cookies, mm-hmm. and then he, they're in the Razor Crest with him putting his hands up in the air, wee, and he's still eating them, and they do all these spins, and then he spits up. <laughs> I'm like. You know what? This whole 
this whole thing would be hitting a lot different if I didn't have kids and have gone through some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because <laughs> I relate completely. 100%. And I pass it on to you, Tyler. I was going to say, you know, as far as I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily want to be the one to, 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 to drop the massive, uh, the name that we got, but you know, there's, there's so many layers to, you know, at, at first I didn't really care for the uh, Ahsoka and Grogu just staring at each other. And then I was like, you know what? Imagine that. Like, Jedi have the ability to feel so many things just from emotion that, and, and, and they train their entire lives doing it. Like, why would you need to speak? You know, we've never really seen a good representation of this other than, you know, I sense this, and then and then we never talk about it again. Um, you know, so I really ended up appreciating that. But when she goes on to talk about like what Grogu has experienced, you know, he was he was a youngling. Uh, he was training. Who got him out of the temple? Mm-hmm. That's what I want to know. That's I I would I would hope. That someone, Filoni or whoever, is like, you know what? We might want to have a like a flashback or two, because there's probably a couple guys out there that are like, how did he get off Coruscant? Somebody had to get him out. Luke. We didn't see it. Luke. So no, 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 way back when, way back when. Oh, way back, way back. Yeah, yeah. like right after like, Order sixty six. Yeah, yeah, before Anakin comes and kills everyone. Like, how? Like, how, who got him out? Who ferried him away? Could have been and, Obi. And then, yeah, but. I mean, he didn't. I I don't know. That would have to be like a. There's others that that I would rather it be than Obi because with sure. Obi it would then be revealed of, okay, you guys didn't see me do this, but I did this, mm-hmm. you know. And you could tie sure. it in and make it work, but he had other things going on, man. Him and Yoda were like, hey, we got to go take care of this Sith Lord and my my former. When it could friend. be, it could be anybody. Mm-hmm. Pick anybody. It it could be like a clerical worker. At the fucking or a, a daycare person, at the, at the Jedi Temple, you know, like, oh shit, Anakin's murdering people. Let's get out of here, you know. I want to see. I want to see who has who's taken care of Grogu up until this point. What if, um, uh, Senator Amadala, Amadala, I'm sorry, no, Senator, um, um, Organa. Had mm-hmm. something to do with it. Maybe he was totally could have. I mean, because we didn't really see him until he went and rescued Yoda. Mm-hmm. You know, he could have been doing something else around that time. I mean, totally. I, there, there's multiple people that it could be. Um, but now they're sending him like, "Hey, go to the top of this mountain. He's going to reach out with the Force, and another Jedi will sense him." The, the big rumor uh, before this season even started is that we were going to get Luke at some mm-hmm. point. Uh, and how they were going to do that was going to be varied. We don't know if we were, if it was actually if they were just going to de-age uh, Mark Hamill to do it, which you could easily do, uh, especially if it's like just an episode like appearance. Well, just like they just like they did in uh, Rise of Skywalker, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean that 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 looked good. It didn't look bad at all. No, there's also like some some people stirring the pot out there of like this would be an opportunity to kind of recast Luke, um, kind of like. Uh, Aldrich Ehrenreich mm-hmm. and Han. Right. Where you, where if you cast him younger or with a different actor, if mm-hmm. we want to do something else, a movie following Luke or a movie set in between uh, the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy, you have an actor who's going to be able to pull this off. And, and like we all love Mark Hamill, he's always going to be our Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. But but get somebody who's going to be able to you know be a little bit younger and do that. And there's been a lot of talk about about Sebastian Stan. I love it. I think he fits it perfectly. And uh I yeah. I think he looks the part and I think he could play the part. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's kind of like, I, I haven't I haven't thought about that. Like how it's kind of uncanny how similar him and young Mark Hamill look. Mhm. Well, there are people that have photoshopped him into some of those scenes, you know, and deep fake and deep fake, stuff yeah. and it doesn't really look super different. Like it's almost mm-hmm. identical and you're just like, "What? What? It's kind of it's kind of different like the mouth is a little bit different, but mm-hmm. It just it does make you wonder though because like mm-hmm. what I really like about what they're doing with this story long term and and I have been, you know, I've put my hand up and said, "Hey, 
I like this show a lot, but some some weeks I don't like it as much because I don't get as much uh, satisfaction out of it for the long game. And uh, no, this week was definitely not that. We got overloaded with a bunch of stuff. We got we got the child's name. We got Jedi references. We got Ahsoka Tano. We got HK assassin droids. Mm-hmm. You know, really, that's the second um, Knights of the Old Republic callback. In a, like this season, you know, you know, so like here's to here's to getting HK forty seven back in this thing. Come on now, there we you can go. Do this. Oh, here's a here's another big one too. Um, between the the Ahsoka duel and when she attacked, when her and Mando fought, now we understand. You know, for people that aren't super nerds, now we understand why Beskar is so uh, so valuable. Mm-hmm. Because lightsabers don't mean shit. Uh, it, it was like basically when, when like another thing with the Kotar, they had the vibra blades. Mm-hmm. It's like it, it's I don't know what if it says what they were made out of, but it's kind of like I could take a guess. <clears throat> when Beskar was a little bit more plentiful, right? Mm-hmm. And so you had things that lightsabers wouldn't wouldn't slice through. So that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yep. I also like the fact that they you know, and since this is Dave uh, doing this, kept it real kept Ahsoka with her white lightsabers. Mm-hmm. You know, how did she get those white lightsabers? Well, they are formerly corrupted lightsabers uh, that have been, like, how you how, how you get a red saber is you get a kyber crystal and you corrupt it with the dark side, with your mm-hmm. own dark side. And then uh, when you cleanse the dark side from that, from that crystal, it then purges it of its color. So that's how she has the white ones. And I, I like that because it sticks true. All these years later, she still has them. Well, and here's something great too. You know, with with the uh, with Mando's payment at the end of the episode, he now has a spear made of pure uh, Beskar that stops lightsabers. So and now we're setting up a duel with Moff Gideon, mm-hmm. where he's got something to at least defend himself and have a chance. Do you think? Uh, let me ask this just quick question. Do you think that that they are somewhat setting up uh, Din? to become the next Mandalore and not Bo-Katan. It's a very interesting thought process there, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Ooh. That's kind of how I felt with, with uh, not necessarily last week's episode, but, you know, with his interaction with Bo-Katan and, and, and uh, you know, getting the reveal that he's actually, he's the product of the Death Watch, which now makes sense. Yeah. On you know it it it, it uh, explains the flashback in season one why because I remember in season one Skylar's like why do they look different well they're they're like you know they're bad Mandalorians they're because they're you know they're fanatics basically is what I said and uh, you know now Mandalorian it makes sense. ISIS yeah now it, I mean now it makes sense um you know and I was talking to somebody at work today like explaining it and they're like. You know, I just don't understand why, like, how would, like, especially the ones that are in his covert, how would they not know that they're products of of the Death Watch or whatever? And I was like, you know what? Think about it this way. If you were raised in Nazi Germany, are you a Nazi or are you a German? You're just a German. So, I mean, it's it's obviously super extreme with, with the Nazi reference, but, mm-hmm. you know, that's the way that it made sense in my head pretty quickly so i don't know i love the drop of that he's a child of the watch that was super like you said that's super cool uh in that last episode um that last episode too was really fun because we got you know the return of cara dune or cara dune however you want to say it and um um, grief cargus thank you directed by carl weathers Mm -hmm. yeah that last episode so that's also i think it's interesting that i don't know if they're doing it for season two but for season one the directing style having all the directors at every thing they did i don't know if you guys saw that but like for every episode all the directors were present for whatever was being shot by whatever special director oh no i didn't know that yeah so they had like they built a team like they called it the magnificent seven or whatever and like Mm -hmm. bryce dallas howard and all these people you see him walking on set and it's really that gallery thing like i really got sucked into it yesterday so it's very fresh but um as far as the 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 jedi episode chapter 13 um the the magistrate being a part of this is really cool 
Uh, we got uh, what is it? Tythos? Is that how you say it? Ty- Tyth- Tython, Tython, not Tythos, yeah. Tython. Um, and that's where the original Jedi Temple is, mm-hmm. where the Jedi were officially uh, created. Um, we were obviously, you know, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just say it because we've been dancing around it for a while, but we learned that Ahsoka is looking for Grand Admiral Thrawn. Oh, my goodness. And I just mm. wasn't expecting it. And I just, like, was, like, I was snacking, and I was just like, oh, shit. Whoa. We watched that last night, and I I, I was digesting all that secondary you know, second second night Thanksgiving food, and I was in the chair and I went, and then she, my wife says that clearly means more to you than it does to me. I went, yes, it it, does. it it dropped and Skylar was sitting to my right and I went like this. I went, oh fuck, <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, she's like, are you okay? And I went, oh fuck, <laughs> oh my god. You know, and it, 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 spoiler alert for, well, we've already spoiler alerted, but, um, you know, at the end of Rebels with, with, with what happens, you know, Sabine and Ahsoka are like, okay, we're going to go, we're going to go look for Ezra and make sure Grand Animal Thrawn's gone. So we'll see you later. And, you know, we've got Ahsoka here, but no Ezra and no, uh, uh, Sabine. So, Thrawn's here, so obviously something went wrong, and uh, I'm vibing it. I'm just vibing. Well, and what and what that's gonna be, hopefully that's gonna manifest into something to come. Because what the one thing that I do like about some of the stuff that they've done is some of the episodes that definitely seem like they're one offs. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I cannot be into it, but like that episode that was prior to this last one. Even though it definitely was Adventure of the Week style ish, we got some big drops at the end, but it but it brought us back to characters who we spent time with last season. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it was like I already know who these characters are. I already know what they're about. Let's see what they're doing now. I'm instantly more invested in them because they're not brand new characters that I know are just gonna not come back. And the s- only thing that I didn't care for is towards the end of the episode, with with how. You know how Reef, Grief Cargus and and Cara Dune act. It almost feels like we're not gonna come back. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I I also like the interaction with the uh with that same uh new Republic pilot. Mm-hmm. He's out there and it's like, hey, like he's working the beat. Yeah, he's working that beat. And, and what I like is that you know we've even had run-ins with him with you know yo with Din. So so he's aware something's going on. He's like, hey hey, there's something going on here trying to put this puzzle together i'm not really sure how it fits together but i'm gonna find you and catch you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll run and tell that <laughs> do do run tell that uh i'm excited for the next episode honestly uh i don't know you know obviously if we're gonna go straight to tython or not no and then like, no this, uh, there's probably gonna be a you little know. side off but we'll, we'll, we have how many left we have three no, uh, yeah, three. Yeah, so we yeah, may not even get shit. there this season. Oh, yeah, that's true. That could be a down the road uh, planted thing. Mm-hmm. But no, I love the episode, guys. I thought it was great. I'm really loving what they're doing in this season of the Mandalorian. Absolutely. Yeah, I will say it's, in it's the great. Star in the Star Wars world, though, we do have a little bit of untimely news or mm-hmm. unfortunate news to discuss because. Um, as recording of this, this is really, really fresh. David Prowse, the original Darth Vader, the guy who there's actually a documentary about his uh, not really return to Vader, but his story of how he was shunned from Vader and all the things that kind of transpired in his time with Star Wars. Um, it's a very interesting story. He, uh, you know, obviously was the first Vader. And there's so much to be said about his, uh, you know, James Earl Jones made the voice happen, but all the motions and everything we know and visualize Vader was his mechanic. Exactly. Exactly, Brando. That, you know, claw in, in Empire Strikes Back. You know, there's so many moments that are that are Vader heavy that are memorable in how he moves. So it is really impactful. His story is really sad, too, because he was wronged by the company, I think, and the way they did him was very dirty. 
Um, for those who don't know, he was literally replaced and not told anything until they had already filmed the person who was going to replace him in the final shot where his helmet is taken off and it's revealed who Vader really is. And that was going to be probably the moment that blew his career up if he had the opportunity to be revealed as Vader. He had done the, the work leading up to, so in Return of the Jedi, you know, he expected it. And I think they sent him away to do reshoots on something. He was like, doing reshoots? I, I, well, I, I, I was expecting that that was the last thing we had to film, so why aren't we filming it? And then they, like, broke it to him. Well, you know, we've actually went in a different direction once the helmets come off. And then they got Curly from Three Stooges. Um <laughs> to play Anakin Skywalker. I can't remember where I heard that. Somebody said that, and I'm like, you know what? Kind of. I kind of yeah, see it. Yeah, it. <laughs> it, looks, it looks it, for sure. But, yeah, it's sad, man. Uh, but he lived a good long life. He got to be a part of the legacy. I will tell you, from that original 77 Star Wars cast, it's down to, really, it's Hamill and and uh, Harrison right now. And, uh, so, and uh, oh, Anthony, Anthony Daniels. Daniels. Yep. Don't want to forget A.D., Mm -hmm. and, and and he said he will never retire as, as long as he can play c3po he'll play him that's amazing i love that he's like you know if i'm gonna do voiceover if i'll do this and that if they want c3po call me i'll do it i'll see three po you later uh, look at you. <laughs> well uh, if that's Lord. that's all we have for mando uh we did decide here on the show that we were going to do batman death in the family or yeah. a death in the family and uh, so we did. We read book one of four, and the, each book has two chapters in it. Um, I don't have it all set up like I did for the other uh, other review that we did, um, where like I had a separate page for all the like some cool pages and everything. So I didn't get that set up. That's my bad. I didn't do the footwork. But um, overall, uh, overall, Tyler, we'll start with you. What did you think of this first part? Uh I it was very strange to me. Uh I'll I'll just be honest. It you know, obviously it's got that that sixties Batman feel for sure. Um and then like I'll just read uh one just one little bubble here that, that kind of puts it in perspective. My very own cruise missile. And then it was like it, I don't know, it just felt very very off the wall to me. Um, I actually had to read it more than once because I was pretty confused on what the hell was happening. So, not bad by any means. The, um, my, it just kind of took me by surprise, I guess. My favorite panel is that. Him just sitting in the chair. <laughs> like, like number one, I don't... who Can, can, can any of us... Cross our legs like that? No. Is that something so. that the generations have just not been able to do? I believe so. Because I used to, I see people do that and they're all older. And it, I see the way, like, I just am I'm noticing because I'm like, okay, you got your, you got your. That looks big, painful, yo. I, I'm, I'm, so I'm trying to do it and I'm like, but I'm looking at like their hips and I'm like, Man, I can't do that. That's like mm -mm. number one and number two. Like I'm scrunching some scrunch down here, and that's kind of uncomfortable. But I just like, like, there's Bruce kind of sitting in the chair, in his outfit, no caper cow, just, just vibing, just yeah, just vibing. Well, I mean, they're talking about talking about Jason and how Jason's kind of losing his. There, <laughs> there's another good panel. <laughs> Of Jason Todd. Of course. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, so, like, I want to say, did did this come out in... Yeah, okay, so this came out in December of 88, mm -hmm. right? So this is after The Dark Knight Returns. Uh, stylistically, like like Tyler said, we're back to the colors of, like, the old 60s style, but it's kind of like mm -hmm. the 70s, 80, early right. 80s. With the with, with the with the gray and blue and Robin is in the you know the typical Robin stuff, and I would say that the overall art style of the comic is it it does feel very seventies, almost a little bit Archie, um, or Jughead, in in that retrospect. Um, also within like how they did black hair, 
they highlight it with blue. Everyone's got blue highlights. To show, like, the shine of black. <laughs> right, and that's something that's a bit older. Um, like, I feel like it, like, it help, it, like, like it helps age it. The other part of the book that I felt is that did it seem to you that it was very coincidental that both characters, Batman and Jason, are on two separate journeys that start at exactly the same time that have nothing to do with each other? Mm-hmm. And they end up in the same country, not the same street, the same block. Right. The same district of town, you know, not like Brooklyn, Gotham or whatever. Hey, hey what are you doing here? I'm looking for my um, f- looking for my mom. Your mom's dead. Not that mom, you idiot. It's like, well, we're both here. Ah, oh, there's Joker with a cruise missile. <laughs> the and, next panel is the two Spider-Mans just pointing at each other <laughs> right. like, eh. hey. Um I also did like how like um you know, Batman is just kicking the shit out of some terrorists. That's America right there. And um <laughs> there's another panel that made me laugh and it's like when Joker uh, and a uh, Joker and his one henchman, he's only got one henchman for this book. And, and I did every, every time I see him, he just, I, I see him going, Mah! <laughs> that's just like, yep. and, uh, but there's a panel where like Joker, he has the freaking uh, pilot goggles and apparatus on. And the other pilot's just laying there dead with the bullet hole. <laughs> And what I like is that he's flying the plane, and I didn't get this at first. Then the stewardess is asking Jason, uh, "No, well, okay, no, okay." So like, Joker's like, "Yes, it is very roomy, and the U.S. Navy shouldn't realize it's missing until sometime tomorrow. By then, we'll be settled in and doing business in Lebanon. This is all working out quite delightfully. How about a rum and coke?" I thought that was Joker saying that. I'm like, you're flying the plane over the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> you maniac. I mean, that fits Joker's style for sure. I know. But then it's like, but then uh, the stewardess says, first class section or not, champ. She calls him champ. <laughs> you look a little ripe for rum. How about some straight Coke instead? Okay. <laughs> Oh, Batman with a Geiger meter. He's like, ah, there's something fishy going on here. Let, uh, I, I better go tackle some terrorists. And he, I like how he wears, he wears his costume under his clothes like Spider-Man or Superman. He's calling Alfred on a long range radio. It's gotta be easy as hell to just, some dude's out there hanging up. Who's Alfred? <laughs> and Alfred's like, yeah, I just n- I just completed a computer check and on all of his credit cards issued on our runaway charge. Like, so here's Robin out there running around with these credit cards. Obviously not that smart. He's like, yeah, I, I'm I'm gonna go do this and never be caught. Meanwhile, I'm just gonna have like happen across, like. Batman, while well, I'm over here looking for my mom, and we're gonna go stop the jo- and th- the Joker's missile. The rocket part explodes, and the warhead doesn't. I'm not a rocket scientist, nor am I a nuclear th- uh, physicist. But it- what are the odds of that? I, don't I think know. it's I think it's pretty wild. I mean. I just think it's wild enough that Joker's out here dealing weapons in Lebanon. Well, where do you think Doc Brown got the idea from, man? My very own cruise missile. That he took apart and then rebuilt. <laughs> That's the best is there, part. Is there more of a Joker thing, though, than to get a cruise <laughs> missile and then immediately take it apart? Like... Well, no, he, you know he didn't take it apart personally. He hired that one henchman to take it apart, and that was a task. Now you have to remember where everything goes, you know. So uh, is it that same henchman that gets beat up 
by by Batman, or is that a different henchman? Let me see. I think it's the same guy. Eh, maybe not. I mean, he's packing his bags and stuff, but Batman knocks him out at one point. But there's 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 a, there's a panel where he's in there going, "We're in the money." <laughs> And then he actually says, we got a lot of what it takes to get along. You know what? All, in all my years, I couldn't remember what that line was because any time I ever heard somebody sing it, they always don't sing the actual words of that spot. And he's just like, hum the melody. So that's what I'm taking from this book. I thank them for actually educating me. I don't know. I thought the, I thought the book was pretty good, but a little too coincidental uh, for, for my tastes. Knowing what comes at the end of this, I'm I'm ex- I'm anxious to see what comes next because obviously this is a big, um, and well known book. And was this the the period where they had people write in to vote? There was a call in line actually. In line. That's I'm glad that you brought that up because I was gonna I was gonna kind of steer it in that direction. Yeah. So when the book first started coming out, that's obviously the big question mark. There's the death symbol. Somebody's gonna die. Something's gonna happen. And then they decided about, I think it was maybe right after book one or somewhere around there, maybe R&D can find this out, that they wanted to decide whether or not to kill Jason Todd. And they felt maybe things were getting stale, so they had they had the fans choose. And they felt, within DC, they felt, well, it's clear everybody's going to pick Jason Todd to die. Except for, he had become a fan favorite, and overwhelmingly he was winning the vote. Really? And what is... Oh, yeah. And what is widely talked about is how Warner or not Warner Brothers, but DC DC. hired within their own company people, interns that they ended up paying money to call into the line and make votes to kill Jason Todd to skew the scales, because no matter what they planned to kill Kill Jason Todd. Yes. So it's it's a big controversy. And and what actually happens, how the book transpires, we do not know. Uh, you know, I will say the story is kind of interesting. You you find out that Jason's mother might still be alive, even though he was told both of his parents died. He was he was it was found out he was adopted, and he goes on the look for his mom, but he doesn't really know her real name. So he's got three possible options, all of which which somehow happen to be in the Middle East for some reason or overseas at the very least. And uh, like Brandon said, it's very coincidental that, you know, Joker steals this thing and decides to head over there and lead Batman there. So it's like, okay, well, those things are converging. And now you've got Batman plus the Joker plus Robin all overseas. And, you know, I want to touch on this. You guys had both said it. The colors are very vibrant. I love Batman in a gray suit. It's one of the things that I don't talk about a lot, but that's my preferred uh, Batman color for him is to have the gray with the blue or the gray with the black. I just think it pops. Um, but, 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 but I think there's still really gritty themes in here. They're trying to tell a dark story that is not as maybe as dark as the Dark Knight Returns, but still dark enough to hook that adult audience. And I think they did a decent job. I didn't hate the book. I think it's very dense. That's my only downside. It's like reading an issue of The Watchmen. It's a lot Mm -hmm. to digest. Tyler said it best. I think it's probably worth a second read through, Mm -hmm. you know, and not, and not just a one go because you'll probably miss some stuff or not understand some things or some themes that are happening within yeah it was just it wasn't bad by any means you know i i I really enjoyed it the second time that i read it it was just for me and i don't know if it's just because i'm you know dad life i'm fucking exhausted and sitting in front of the computer trying to read something you know attention span but the first time it, it was a little bit hard to follow for me um just because, you know, part of it was, Brandon said it perfectly, everything was too convenient. You know, it's like, I, I, I don't know. But I but I, I am, even though I didn't enjoy this one, this first, um, this first book, uh, a whole bunch, I am really, really looking forward to, you know, how it moves forward. Yeah, it, it ended very... Um... Uh, very uh, coincidentally, too, because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, we didn't find Jason's mom. So we're moving on to the other place where Jason's mom might be. And just so happens, Joker's going that way, too. Right. You know, and, and the ending of this part, sto- of this story part, where they were able to stop the missile, stop that sale, stop these bad guys, and still come out on top and be good guys at the end. It's like, well, you know, 
Jason's like, I'm not leaving. I got my mom to find. And Bruce is like, fine, then we'll do it. You know, I took care of this part. It's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, let's go do it. And I and I do like that part because it really seemed like there was kind of a rift where Batman wanted him to take some time off because he felt like he couldn't deal with he, he, he hadn't settled down with and dealt with the reality of the death of his parents. Whereas like um, uh, now this new revelation has kind of come through and it's a bit of a long shot. And I'm also excited to see where it goes, but to the same token, I wasn't really blown away by it either. There, there's a few few key things that really kind of got my interest and thought it was really cool about, but other than that, I'm excited more for the next issue. I think this is one of those books where it's a lot of setup and a lot of build up. Yeah. And at some point, it's going to blow its top, and we have to kind of be... Uh, not really adjusting our expectations, but just managing the expectation that the first book is not as solid as it maybe could be. But we don't know where it goes. And maybe we, again, look back and say, well, book one set everything up how we needed it to to get to the journey we got to. I personally think that, um, you know, the Joker, he had his henchman knocked out, maybe not killed. And that henchman maybe came to while they were discussing where they were going next. And they're on the ground there, just not too far from where Batman and all them guys are talking. Maybe he hears where they're going and cued Joker in and Joker becomes, you know, kind of goes on the mission of like, I'm going to get revenge on Batman for taking my money and my opportunity. And this has become, you know, kind of a, you know, a, a Avengers. journey quest. Avengers. Yeah, Avengers. Okay. Hmm, interesting. I'm excited to see where it goes, though. But uh, overall, like, what would you rank this, guys? Mm. I think this is a lower ranking, honestly. Mm -hmm. I want to give this like a two point seven five stars. Three. Three from Tyler. I'm gonna give it I'm gonna give it an even three just because you know, if I was any harsher than that, I would feel that it wouldn't be fair because of you know, I, I, I feel like my first attempt at reading it maybe maybe wasn't as you know, I might have been playing on my phone too much or or Ruby might have been, you know, pestering me to do something. You know, I didn't I didn't give it the full attention I think that it deserved on the first read. So I, I, I think, you know, especially with all the other books and series that we've talked about on this show, you know, I think a three, anything, unless it's absolutely incredible or, um, you know, like industry breaking on the new stuff that it tries to do, you know, I, I, I think a three is fair. And, you know, if we, if we hit our, if we just say five on all of them, you know, how fair is that? Right. You know, so. See, I was right I there with Nate. Fair. I was right there with Nate. I was thinking uh, 2.75, almost a three. Uh, because I just felt like, I don't know, just reiterate, it was a little too coincidental. A little mm -hmm. too. Like, I felt like they could have come up with some better ways to integrate these stories together. Or, or maybe you don't integrate them right here in this first issue, you know. I mean, I, I understand you're only doing four, but, like, you have another part of the story. You could have had Jason Todd go over there in this issue or Batman go over, and somehow they both converged, and they both and they both don't, don't know what they're doing. Right. And then, you know, with a little bit more lead-up and them doing their own thing, then it crosses over. But it kind of seemed like it was a – I don't want to say rushed because there was a lot of context here, but it just, you know, just too uh, coincidental for me. You know, uh, let me just jump in and really quickly say that I, I just now in this moment looked ahead at what's the next ep what's what the next issue didn't obviously read it, but I just did a quick scroll of like some of the shit you're going to see. And let me just say issue two is where the story pops off <laughs> the thing. The visualistics that I witnessed accidentally just scrolling for a second have changed my opinion just in this moment about some of the things we've just said. But. I digress. We'll save that for next time for sure. I, d I did enjoy this uh, enough, but it wasn't. It's like a really early edition. I got to see how mm -hmm. the house looks when it's finished. I can't, I can't, yeah. you know, I can't make the judgment call yet. Absolutely. Uh, now, before we get out of here, guys, I have a couple little headlines. Nothing too, you know, time consuming or long. Uh, all of it's Marvel related. So we're, you, we're going to. Now we're going to end with Marvel. We just did a whole thing on DC. We had some Star Wars in here as well. Uh, did you hear about Daredevil? No. Uh, it's back in Marvel's control now, right? 100%. And, and here's the interesting thing about the timing of that. And this is, what I, this is what I wanted to give you guys really quickly. This is one of the few things. 
Daredevil just returned the rights to Marvel. The next Spider-Man movie has just started filming. We know Charlie Cox desperately wants to continue the role of Matt Murdock. Do we see Matt Murdock show up in the third Spider-Man movie, possibly considering all the shit we know is getting packed into that film? Uh, I mean, it's possible, but I mean, you'd have to make it make sense. Well, now, he's in New York. He just got sure. out it. Spidey needs a good lawyer. No, I get you. I get you with that. It, 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 but it's to the point of, do you bother going for the full Daredevil storyline in there, or do you just introduce him as Matt Murdock? And we know who he is, but nobody else does yet. I think that would be the easiest way to do it, and maybe it's a, acceptable yeah. to do it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's because he's already got they already have the backstory, and you could even look at some of the Netflix stuff and say, sure, that's canon. It's not everything he's done, obviously, mm -hmm. and it's only the start of the tip of the iceberg. But this is our guy, and this is the stories we're going to tell moving forward. I think, you know, one thing that I think they would have to do though is if you're going to introduce Matt Murdock then you have to introduce the kingpin in some form because, you know, say whatever you want about Daredevil. He's kind of like, you can't just have Daredevil. You have to have kingpin too. You know what I mean? Totally. But how amazing would it be for Vincent D'Onofrio to face off against Tom Holland, Spider-Man as well, considering. Well, and let's not you know, forget. So that let's, wraps the bow. Sorry. Let's not, okay. let's not forget too that, you know, John Bernthal still wants to play Punisher. Mm-hmm. The I fan think he base, will withstand being Punisher. He definitely will continue. The, the fan be. base still wants him to play Punisher. And, you know, the rumors that we've read for the last two years now are that Marvel Studios still wants John Bernthal to be Punisher. I'm in the camp that I firmly believe everyone they cast are people they want to have those roles be portrayed as, and they're not going to double back unless the actor is a problem I'm looking at you, Terrence Howard. I'm looking at you, Edward Norton. Well, also some of the stuff that was some of the casting and stuff that happened at, during that time period was also uh, done under a different kind of regime. It, it, you know, Kevin Feige hadn't been given the keys to the castle just yet. Mm -hmm. He had kind of come in right after the, some of those shows had already been in development, and so um, notice that there there's a stark quality change. Once we have Feige 100% taking over, I'm trying to remember the name of the other guy. And I know we talked about it here on the show way back when in the archives um, when Feige officially has taken over. And, and the guy that was there before that was making some bad calls. And uh, he, 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 it wasn't necessarily like Feige when, – when, when Feige got the keys, he didn't have keys to the entire castle either. He didn't have keys to that, that – that television aspect was kept a little bit separate. And uh, other people were in charge. Now it's not not now it's not this, not not that way with Disney Plus and everything and, and it all being integrated. Uh, it's all under one house and under one umbrella, and that's only going to be good. But from what I've understood, Charlie Cox and Bernthal are the guys that they want to come back. Everybody else they're not really interested in at this time. And that's sad because I think Kristen Ritter killed as Jessica Jones. I think she's an absolute perfect per – I know, obviously, do you need Jessica Jones on the big screen? Probably not, but, um, you know, who knows? Maybe Iron Fist. Yeah, there you go. See, that's, you, you hit the nail on the head. Now, interestingly enough, I talked about Spider-Man possibly being a place where Charlie Cox makes a secret cameo debut of chance or something. That movie has now become controversial. Have you guys heard about what's going on with Spider-Man 3? Yeah. In Georgia? Yeah, so essentially in Georgia, the law or the rule of the land right now is that uh, you can't pack schools as if school is happening uh, because real schools are an online school right now because of the, the pandemic. Marvel literally countered and said, listen, because this is Spider-Man and because of what the movie is about, it is vital to the success and time sensitivity of our movie. We have to have... Uh, schools to be able to shoot in with people and actors portraying students and they were approved for it shockingly enough so it's, it's a pretty crazy deal when the real school systems are shut down but they can allow fake school and i think that's creating the controversy where parents are going like hey man we're fucking struggling here because e-learning what the, what the shit that's a very complicated matter to comment on um because every state is different but also like georgia works really well with a lot of different organizations and uh, production companies. 
a lot of people do production stuff in Georgia because it's a lot of kickbacks and the government works really well with them. So on on that on that case, I'm not necessarily surprised that the government of Georgia said, "Yeah, go ahead." But it does kind of send a mixed message to the citizens of the state. Mm-hmm. It definitely does. Uh, that that as far as um, Spider-Man stuff is really all I have. There's one last little thing. It's really tiny, but it, it comes into the rumor mill conjecture. We're you know a little over a month and change now away from WandaVision. And another uh, former MCU character might be reprising their role. Has anybody heard this? Mm, a big robot dude? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. The possibility is is that whether it be via flashback or via her own power creating him, because of, vi- uh, because of Ultron's very strong ties to the creation of Vision and the journey that Vision is going to be going on, it is possible we'll have the return of Ultron. And, of course, due to the Emerald City Comic Con and a uh, leaked pop, we know it is highly likely that Aaron Taylor Johnson's Quicksilver will also be returning for the series. Cool. So that's that's pretty amazing. And the way that I see that is that I'm not 100% sure if any of these characters are going to be sticking around or if this is all just going to be a really mental you know, mind fuck for these characters to be going through in this own little pocket universe that has been created. Exactly. Because I think, and I hope that's what it's going to be in that trailer. When you see vision being told that he is dead, it's like, then he has to start questioning his own existence and he only exists because she's recreated it in some way. Well, and let's time out on his death. He didn't die once. Yeah. He died twice. Motherfucker died died by his wife's hands. And he remembers that. Yeah. And he got brought back. And killed again by Thanos. Mm-hmm. That's a shitty way to go. It makes you wonder if he's going to know that or if he, these are going to be things like, he's, is he going to become self-aware? And we're going to get to see that. that that's going to be very interesting to watch. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to that series. I can't wait to see what comes out of that. That's the first Marvel thing we're going to get from Disney+. Plus. Mm-hmm. We're super in love with The Mandalorian and the, everything they've been doing there. So I just feel like, Wanda Vision is probably going to follow suit. We like a lot of the MCU stuff, um, and we're really fond there. But guys, I don't. Is there anything else we want to touch on, dive into, talk about uh, before we roll out of here today? That's good for me, man. I'm good. Well, as always, folks, you can check out Journey into Comics Network at journeyintocomics.com. Get the flagship show, Journey into Comics podcast, as well as Journey into Wrestling, and amazing other shows that are going to be popping up on the feed. As 2021 rolls on, 2020 kind of derailed the network a little bit, but we've battled through it. We've continued to release stuff for you fine folks. Make sure to get us on all the different podcasting platforms, whether it's Apple Music, Amazon Music, Pod, Podbean, Spotify, CastBox, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, and many others, as well as YouTube. Just search Journey into Comics Network. Make sure to subscribe. Give us a five-star on Apple Music if you can. And I think that is going to do it. For this week's episode, this has been Journey into Comics 324. Brando, what should we call this bad sucker? Buddy, I don't even know. This is like the yeah. second time that we've been on, like, been on together with with you know with Tyler, and we were just like, I don't know what we're gonna call it. I think <laughs> I want to call this one the baby called Steve, <laughs> or the child called Steve. You know, because then you can just take a picture of. Grogu, and then put a my name is tag on him and write Steve. Real <laughs> God, that's perfect. Yeah, so this has been Journey into Comics 324. A my child name, named Steve. My name is Steve. <clears throat> my name's Jeff. I've been Nate. I've been TY. I've been Brando. And as always, pop your caps back and fill your brains with shit. Later, guys. Bye. Later.